question is that this House do now adjourn. Matt Weston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, we are all agreed the UK has a housing crisis. No matter which party is speaking, there is a universal recognition of the desperate need to urgently increase the supply of housing. So then there's no debate, surely, is there? But the global financial crash had a catastrophic impact on the house building industry in this country. Given much of the credit crunch was down to bad debts in particular, resulting from bad lending in the US domestic housing market, this was perhaps to be expected. In just two years, the number of homes built crashed 30%, and with it the supply of housing just dried up. That economic shock forced the then Labour government to drive for affordable house building as part of an economic stimulus programme to help the country through the deep recession. By 2009, the foundations for a new era of affordable house building were laid with a £4 billion annual affordable housing programme backing for councils to receive grant funding and build new council housing uh, and full localisation of council housing finance agreed with the Treasury to boost building still and a programme of progressively higher standards agreed with industry to make all new build homes zero carbon by 2016. It was a comprehensive programme. However, since 2010 and the change of government, public policy has been perceived as at best indifferent and at worst hostile to affordable housing. One of the first decisions of Conservative ministers after the 2010 election was to cut back new housing investment by more than 60%. As a result, the number of new government-backed homes for social rent being started each year has plummeted from almost 40,000 homes to fewer than 1,000 last year. The number of new low-cost ownership homes being built has halved. And the plans that Labour left to get council building 10,000 homes a year were undermined, dashing any hopes of councils being able to build at scale again. At the same time as the, new, as the number of new homes being built has fallen, there has been a huge loss of existing social homes. In 2012, right-to-buy discounts were hiked to a massive £100,000. I will indeed give way. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Just on a point of information, is the Honourable Gentleman aware that since 2010, more than three times as many council houses have been delivered than in the 13 years previously, the golden era of Labour government he talks about? I thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman for uh, his intervention. And yes, the figures do, do state that. But of course, you, when you look, drill down into the numbers, you will find, as was made just across the chamber, that they were provided by Labour authorities. And that has been despite the, uh, the, the, the borrowing cap that has been placed on them. If without that borrowing cap, as I will come on to, uh, you will understand, one will understand, I mean you in general, uh, that there would be far greater supply uh, being available. Despite a promise of one-for-one -one replacements, in some areas only one in five homes sold has been replaced. Then a new kind of publicly funded housing was introduced, branded affordable rent by ministers, with rent set at up to 80% of the market price, and this was directly linked to often unaffordable private market rents. I will indeed give one. Um, I, I feel sure that my honourable friend is likely to come on to the point, but would he agree with me that the term affordable housing is an offence uh, to the English language, uh, as affordable clearly doesn't mean affordable if it's 80% of market rent? Well, I, I thank my honourable friend for her very uh, informed uh, uh, intervention, and uh, my very next sentence was actually going to, uh, to, to come to that, in that if it's already expensive, Making it 80% of expensive is still expensive, and that is where we find ourselves. Indeed, I will give way. Thank him, thank him for, for giving way. I mean, he mentioned right to buy. Uh, is, does he agree with me that some of those right to buy uh, houses, which were originally bought by the renters, have now been sold on often to landlords, and some of those properties are not in the best of care and, and on many estates they are the ones that really stick out where and often rogue landlords are, are not looking after those properties. I thank my honourable friend uh, for his timely intervention and, and of course he is absolutely correct that, that one of the issues that we've had over recent decades is that so much of this property has fallen into the hands of 
of landlords and others, and where the investment has not been made, and where they are now charging extortionate rents, where if it had been left to local authority provision, uh, those, uh, those renting would actually be uh, able to afford the properties more readily. So organisations bidding for government grants were then told to relet homes for low-cost social rent at the new so-called affordable rent. And it's now estimated that 150,000 homes for social rent have been lost in the fi last five years. More recently, the government has proposed adding to the sell-off by extending the right to buy to housing association tenants, funded by an extraordinary forced sell-off of council housing to the highest bidder. I'd like to thank my honourable friend for allowing me to uh, intervene. Um, and I just wish to associate myself with the points that he makes and the very genuine and deep concern which he shows for the needs of tenants across the country, many of whom are struggling with high housing costs, as indeed they are in my constituency of Reading East. Um, would he agree with me that it was a, really quite a, um, an outrageous mistake and a serious error of the Conservative Government to uh, stop many local authorities from uh, building council houses when indeed they had fully costed schemes ready to go which were indeed shovel ready? I particularly would like to mention the case of Reading, which had a plan for a thousand new council houses, which was unfortunately stopped by George Osborne in 2015. Uh, I thank my honourable friend for his, his intervention, and, and, and he is, of course, absolutely correct. This, this suppression of building uh, low-cost rent uh, properties by, by local authorities where they know there is need allowing them that responsibility, preventing them from actually supplying it, I think has had a huge social cost in our communities, but not just social, an economic cost as well. Indeed, I would. Um, would he also agree with me that preventing councils from building housing means uh, that it's unlikely that the government will achieve its target of building 300,000 homes a year, that the last time those figures reached were actually in 1969, when both councils and housing associations were building, as was the private sector. I thank uh, my honourable friend once more. Uh, uh, not only is my honourable friend very informed, but very uh, experienced in this particular matter. And she is absolutely right that, uh, that the highs of housing that we've needed uh, over, the, over the decades have been delivered uh, by a mix of providers. And the crucial element that is now missing is that provided by local authorities. And in their absence, we will never achieve the objective that is being set by the current government. And it's worth just looking through the decades when you see that, particularly in the post-war periods of the 20s and then in the 50s and 60s, how the local authorities were allowed to uh, ensure good supply of housing, which they recognised was needed because of the, the constraints in the private sector. It is worth looking at this really in the round and really over the last 10 years the overall supply of new homes has seen an under delivery of at least 80 to 100,000 homes a year and the result that the UK faces a desperate shortage of at least 1 million homes. In fact the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors now forecasts that this will reach a shortage of 1.8 million low cost rental properties that's just low-cost rental properties, by 2022. All areas of the UK need housing, both public and private, but there is particular and desperate need for low-cost housing for rent. In my own constituency in Warwick and Leamington, there are over <coughs> 2,400 people on the housing waiting uh, list and homes are being built, but not enough homes are under construction to satisfy this social need. It is once again the case that it's the wrong mix of housing that is being delivered. So what is the answer? Well, of course, opinions vary, and the solutions presented before the electorate in last year's election showed some clear blue water between the main parties. Recognising the critical importance of the housing shortage, in its 2017 manifesto, we, the Labour Party, committed to the creation of a new department for housing. And importantly... In terms of house building, we promised at least one million new homes over the next Parliament, which, as we now know, can be a very short time, and a new target to set, see 250,000 new homes a year being built by 2022. And of these, at least 100,000, or 40% minimum, 
would be genuinely affordable homes to rent and buy per year, including the biggest council house building programme in more than 30 years. If I'm very honest, personally, I would like to see a lot more. Subsequently, at the autumn party conferences, much time and debate was given over to this challenge, and the Prime Minister herself announced that she was committed to delivering 300,000 new homes. Specifically, she stated that £2 billion be committed to helping the delivery of affordable housing, but of course this equates to just 25,000 properties. So clearly housing is rising up the political agenda and it is now one of the biggest domestic issues that we face. My contention is that we now face a social crisis that is without precedent in the last past 50 years. We have thousands of families without their own homes waiting desperately for accommodation. We have record numbers of people rough sleeping. In my constituency, Warwick and Leamington, we have the highest number in terms of people per thousand population in the whole of the West Midlands. Over the decades, the overall supply of housing has not delivered. Now must be the time to change this. I am convinced that council housing was, is and will be the answer to our housing crisis. It is simply the case that the government needs to release local authorities from the bounds of their borrowing cap and to allow them to use their pension funds to invest in their communities, and that the use of public land holds the key to unlocking the potential to deliver this. Selling public land just simply to the highest bidder will not solve anything. Land is the fundamental denominator in the cost equation of UK housing, and the planning process surrounding it needs urgent, radical reform. Building more council housing solves at least two key issues. Firstly, the lack of genuinely affordable housing for those who can't afford market rents. Secondly, the chronic supply, undersupply rather, of housing, which is the root cause of our housing crisis. As I said earlier, there is a lack of genuinely affordable housing, with historically high waiting lists of 1.16 million households nationally. And the easiest way to help those in need is to provide council housing. If we fail to do this, the result will be increasing homelessness, and we have witnessed that this has more than doubled since 2010 nationally. Another less frequently made argument is that building more council housing is the key to boosting overall supply, which is the root cause of the UK housing crisis. The government's own target is 300,000 new homes each year, but the additional homes delivered in 1617 was 217,000, falling well short of its own target. Although last year was the first year since the financial crisis that over 200,000 homes were added, and I do applaud that, it was not enough, and the wrong mix of homes is being built. It is now stated that 300,000 will just about keep up with demand. Even if the government hits this, it is unlikely to significantly bring down house prices and rents. <coughs> And as I was saying just a moment ago, to deliver that 300,000, we need all providers to be supplying into that figure. History provides important learnings. It's no coincidence that house building rates reached their post-war peak during the 50s and 60s, when successive governments were committed to both private sector and public sector house building. At the time, housing was plentiful and house prices stayed low so that many on low to average incomes could afford to rent or buy their own homes. The success of the 50s and 60s, however, shows that prioritising council housing needn't be a partisan issue. Harold Macmillan, the Conservative Housing Prime Minister from 1951 to 1954, initiated some of the greatest council house building programmes to meet his target of building 300,000 homes a year. During those Macmillan years, local authority housing made up 87%, 84%, 77%, 69% of completed dwellings by year. But this compares with just 1% in each of the last four years under this government, or around 20% each year, including housing associations as well as councils. Importantly, and I want to draw credit where it is due, as I have illustrated elsewhere, 
Post-war conservatives recognise that the public sector must build the homes that the private sector simply will not during a housing crisis, and that is where we find ourselves. So why won't this government? I would like to believe that it is not simply ideology which says the state is bad and private sector good and that it will solve all our problems. Because this crisis is holding back our country socially, and I can't stress enough, economically. I believe that there is a duty on One Nation Conservatives to come forward and urge the government to commit to a mass council housing building programme if they are serious about solving our housing crisis. In this light, I have recently relaunched with my uh, honourable friend for Stroud the parliamentary campaign for council housing and invite all MPs to get involved with this cross-party initiative to see more council houses being built. Central government policy currently acts as a disincentive for councils to build more council homes. Firstly, because there is next to no funding from central government for the provi uh, provision of council housing. Secondly, because there has just been 5.9 billion gross investment in social housing in 2015-16, compared with 10 billion in 2009 to 10. And the vast majority of this will be directed to housing associations. And this then compares to 22 billion forecasted to be spent on housing benefit in the 17-18 financial year, which is a direct result of not building the housing we need. Isn't that ironical? Surely this government would rather not line the pockets of landlords in the private sector and would prefer to invest long term in the council housing we need. Isn't that pragmatic? The additional £2 billion investment announced by the Prime Minister at the conference was welcome but will only provide a few thousand homes by 2021. And this includes the affordable homes, which can be anything up to 80% of the market rent and is not ring-fenced to genuinely affordable social rents. As I said earlier, the borrowing cap stifles the council's ability to build where councils can currently only borrow up to a certain amount to invest in council housing. I welcome the announcement in the autumn budget by the government to raise the cap by a total of £1 billion for areas under high affordability pressures. But more needs to be done. If the government accepts that the cap stifles building, then why will it not lift the cap entirely for all areas, as has been done in Scotland? I will indeed give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. On, the, on that very point about the economics of house building, uh, will he agree with me that there is a considerable need in high-cost areas for greater house building? And in many of those areas, certainly in Reading, there is actually a lot of available land, in our case, brownfield land from our light industrial past, and I would assume also in Leamington and Warwick, possibly. And would he agree with me that what is needed now is urgent government action to free up that land in order to support the local economy in those areas and indeed to support local public services? We have a particular pressure in my area on, the, uh, on local schools and the NHS where people move away to lower cost areas. Um, I would like to uh, ask for his endorsement of those oh, points. I thank uh, my honourable friend uh, indeed for his, uh, his very informed and relevant uh, intervention. He is of course absolutely right that this essentially leads to uh, what may be described as social cleansing, that we are actually uh, creating ghettos of particular types of community when what we must be striving for is sustainable balanced communities for our economic and social good. So I totally endorse uh, what my honourable friend was saying. By releasing the cap, it's estimated that that, that would then allow £7 billion uh, to be injected over five years, and that would provide an additional 60,000 council homes. Even the Treasury Select Committee, chaired by the honourable member for Loughborough, has called for this and stated that, and I quote, the raising of the cap would have no material impact on our national debt, but could result in a substantial increase in the supply of housing. And the Local Government Association also agrees. In my view, we should lift the cap entirely and take borrowing to invest in council housing off the country's balance sheet, as is standard in other European countries. Why not? Returning to the use of land and its availability, there is clearly much land available, but it is questionable in terms of its efficient use. As my honourable friend was just alluding to, there is land, there is public sector land, there is brownfield land, 
but it is all about the planning process and how that land is actually brought into uh, the equation to deliver affordable housing. And the current planning uh, policy framework actually makes it prohibitively expensive for this to happen. The whole process needs radical reform, in my view. Councils are currently incentivized to sell off overpriced land they own to the highest bidder, rather than use it for the common good. This needs to be reconsidered urgently. I am calling for us to recognize this national crisis in housing by legislating for all unused local authority and public sector land to be used exclusively for council housing. That is the nature of the crisis we face. The inflated land prices across our land are preventing local authorities from being able to assemble the land to build on. Currently, land is priced at its potential future development value rather than its existing use value, as done in other countries. This pushes up the cost of undeveloped land, which would be suitable for housing development, making investment in council housing more expensive. Bizarrely, it also rewards landowners for housing and infrastructure developments to which they don't contribute. The homelessness charity Shelter has argued that a few small reforms to the 1961 Land Compensation Act and associated legislation on compulsory purchase orders <coughs> would enable local authorities to purchase land at a fair market value, one that reflects both the current value of the land, reasonable compensation, and allows for the delivery of high quality affordable developments. This is not rocket science. This is not complicated. This is what they do in other European and other countries. It is just about changing the planning approach so that it favours the, the local give authorities. I will indeed give way. Would the honourable, <coughs> honourable member agree that the current Section 106 arrangements and the community investment levy have failed to deliver affordable housing for our local communities? My honourable friend is absolutely correct as ever, uh, and, and, and uh, it, is, it is something of a, uh, a, a, uh, a sp an area which needs radical reform, that the Section 106 monies are understood by few, and the actual uh, provision uh, from those monies being attributed to, to housing uh, is, 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 is not actually uh, being realised. And this goes back to my whole point about how uh, the planning process and the, the planning uh, policy framework needs urgently uh, to be addressed. Then there is the right to buy policy, which means that councils currently only retain one third of receipts from homes sold through right to buy, while the rest goes to treasury coffers. Why should that be? Surely it should be in the, in the gift of the local authority. They are the ones that are adding the value to this process, not the Treasury and not the developer. This means council housing is lost and never replaced. 40% of that stock is now in the hands of private landlords who, in some cases, are charging up to 50% more rent than is being charged for comparable local authority-owned housing. But it also acts as a disincentive for councils to build. Why risk building new council homes when they could be bought three years later yeah. and two-thirds of the receipts will then go to the Treasury? I believe that right to buy in its current form must be scrapped or at the very least radically reformed if we want to build the new homes we need. At very least, councils must be allowed to retain 100% of the receipts from the homes that they lose. So in summing up, we urgently need to change the language around housing in this country. For 40 years, the sector has become dominated by talk of assets and investments rather than the provision against the essential needs of people for security, for refuge, for living, <coughs> for living. But they also meet the needs of our society more widely and determine the communities in which we live. Housing is so simple, so fundamental, so, so basic. They, housing and our communities provide our sense of place and our connectedness. However, what is rarely discussed is the vital importance of low-rent council and social housing to the UK economy and how this has been ignored by recent governments. High rents contribute to pressure on household budgets. It leads to lower savings. 
It leads to lower consumption. It may lead to poorer health. The time has come to address this failing and urgent need to restore the much needed balance to the UK housing sector by allowing local authorities to build council housing on a scale not seen since the 1970s. That would mean 120,000 new council homes being delivered per year across the UK. Mr Deputy Speaker, council housing was and is the answer to our housing crisis. I have absolutely no doubt about that. It's about time the government recognised this and got on with the job of building them. Thank you. Dr David Drew. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, I'm delighted to... Uh, make a very short contribution. I'm sure the Minister will be pleased to hear that. Uh, can I congratulate my uh, honourable friend um, and close colleague on this issue? Uh, I think uh, what he had to say is very well worth listening to. I just wish to make a couple of observations which relate largely to my own locality of Stroud, but I come to help the Minister, not to in any way criticise, because I think we have to recognise that this is not something about party politics, it's about the way in which we need to deal with this housing problem and we need to deal with it now. And it is a plea, uh, and this follows a letter that uh, has been sent by my own local authority, Stroud District, on behalf of uh, both myself and the Honourable Member for the Cotswolds, um, who doesn't necessarily sign up to all in the letter, but we felt it important that it's been sent to the department so they understand some of the issues we're facing and it is about the way in which the housing revenue account now is almost acting bizarrely against the very thing that the government wants to do which is to build more houses and to make sure that we have houses that are fit for the people who desperately need rented accommodation and the two pleas uh, are, are around firstly as my honourable friend has already said adjusting or possibly removing the current borrowing cap so that uh, Stroud District Council can undertake further prudential borrowing that's consistent with its 30-year business plan and on the back of that that will enable the uh, council to use 100% of its uh, right to buy capital receipts to build these new council homes. Stroud District Council is not unique, but it is unusual in as much it now owns its own stock. We bid £98 million pounds, uh, for the self-financing uh, regime, which the government kindly made available. So this is a question of Stroud District Council wanting to use its own resources in the most appropriate ways. It's had a five-year uh, capital programme, building some... 236 council homes, which is for a small area like Stroud, is a not insignificant commitment and contribution. And that has not in any way crowded out the private sector, it's been alongside the private sector. These homes are of a high standard, they're taking people out of fuel poverty, uh, their lifetime um, arrangements uh, mean that these quality homes are homes that people want to live in. Uh, it's a myth that people end up in council housing because they have no other alternatives. These are very much bid after homes and ones that we would want to see alongside other forms of affordable homes. Local business, again, is very supportive of this and uh, highlights the need for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for um, housing to be given a very high priority because that's a simple reason why people can live and work in the Stroud district. So we estimate locally we need 425 new units per annum and, and effectively at the moment that would be all the units being provided. Uh, currently though of the 430 new homes built in 2015-2016, the last uh, date for which we have figures, only 120 of those were affordable, that's 28%. So we're well below our level of need and uh, it's a question of not meeting the demand that is currently there. We've got uh, 2,525 households on the housing register with around 440 new lettings of social and affordable housing each year. 
Rent levels in the private sector are increasing much quicker than we would want, and that, of course, is, again, leading to people looking for alternatives to the private sector, one of which, of course, is uh, uh, council housing. And that's particularly true of younger people. Now, in Stroud, the average wage to house price ratio is now 1 to 10. That's above the national average of 1 to 8, which means that fewer people are getting into uh, owner-occupiership. Uh, and that, again, is a reason why people are looking for alternatives in terms of rented accommodation. The standards of the private rented sector, dare I say, in Stroud is not good, necessarily. And that, again, drives people to look at the ways in which social housing, in particular council housing, can provide the answer. And there are some elements, of course, that we would always want to provide in terms of extra care, which, again, needs to be mentioned. It's not just about younger people, younger families. It's about providing the social care element, which only really the, the council can do because of the need to recognise how they have to uh, provide that, that level of uh, supply. We've had a 30% increase um, over the last year in terms of homelessness applications, and that again is a driver. Now, one thing in particular for the Minister to, to address is the local housing allowance. I mean, in a previous debate, I have argued that the simple fact that Stroud is, is, is um, included within Gloucester and the Forest of Dean does cause us problems because we are a higher rented area. Uh, and that means that because the local housing uh, allowance is based on the average, um, people paying rents have to make good the difference between what they're allowed and, again, what uh, uh, the, uh, the benefit system permits. So this is a, an appeal. It's an appeal to the government to work with us, to allow us to carry on with our council housing programme. Uh, we've got over 5,000 homes allocated in terms of the local plan but sadly too few of those are coming forward if the local authority could play a bigger part we would bring forward those homes we would make sure that we're able to deal with this housing shortage which i'm sure all sides of the house would agree is real and pertinent at the moment so we need a range of housing and in part as part of that housing we need council housing we believe that from all that the council has done, and it's a cross-party agreement, the local Conservatives support this programme. They were instrumental. We are a home council, and they have been willing to stay with it over a longer period of time. So we really do need help with either the housing revenue account cap to be removed or at least relaxed so we can get back on to this programme. The sad thing is, because of the cap, it's likely we're going to have to pay back to the government a million pounds in unapplied right to buy receipts in 2016 and 17. The minister looks a bit querulous, but that is the reality. If you haven't got the ability to match fund, then you pay back the money from the receipts that, it, that you have got. So, I mean, again, the minister, I'm not expecting him to say there's a magic solution, but if he would look at that, just to make sure that we're not having these... Uh, uh, anomalies in the system that the very people who want to build uh, are being prevented from build and that's made worse by the 1% rent reduction which again is yeah. quite difficult in terms of the way in which that impacts on the yeah. flexibility that councils need to have in terms of their own um, business plan in our case a 30 year business plan so overall that has an impact a negative impact of some 10 million pounds which is a huge um, influence on the number of houses, we reckon that's 100 houses that we haven't been able to build and we would want to build. So I hope the Minister's listened. I'm not expecting him to come up with all the magic solutions, but we will work with the Minister. We're a good authority. We're an authority that want to, to uh, uh, overcome these problems with the lack of affordable housing, particularly council housing. And I hope that the Minister hears and will give us some knowledge that at least the government is willing to contemplate looking at the borrowing requirement and looking at the way in which the right to buy does affect authorities like Stroud. Well, thank you, Dame Rosie. Um, it's a pleasure to speak in this adjournment debate. And can I congratulate the Honourable Member for Warwick for securing this important debate on local 
Authority Housing. I appreciated his thoughtful speech and I was even sympathetic for his yearning for a turn to the Macmillan era, although um, I'm not quite sure how far he would go in that regard. He's raised a number of important issues and I'll try and address some of them in turn. He, he, he omitted one or two others and I might seek to address those as well. Um, the reality is that in the last year, the, we've seen 217,000 new homes delivered. That's the highest level for all but one of the last 30 years. He also referred to the financial crash, and there was clearly a big impact that that had on the housing market. Uh, I think the Honourable Gentleman will be relieved, though, to note that this month the national data for the last year showed the number of new builds, starts and completions at their highest level since 2007. So that is good news and positive for home buyers um, up and down the country. But, um, oh, and he also referred to the record of the last Labour government on council homes, but as my honourable friend has already mentioned, uh, under this government we've seen over 10,000 new local authority homes built, and that's triple the amount under the entire 13-year period of the previous government. But nonetheless, I, I, I have to say I accept the premise of his speech and the restlessness to do much, much more. And there's no escaping from the fact that we have a housing crisis, and he's focused very much on council housing, but actually across the board, we've got to be building more homes. And providing good quality and affordable homes for people who need them is an absolute top domestic priority for this government. And of course, I give way to the honourable gentleman. Um, uh, thank you for giving way. I speak as the chair of the board of Warsaw Housing Group, and so uh, I felt almost affronted at the idea that housing associations don't get a mention because I believe in 2016-17 there were 47,000 starts for new homes built by housing associations and for WHG they are celebrating their 15th birthday this week so over that period they will have built or acquired 2,000 new homes but more importantly perhaps spent 700 million pounds modernising their existing stock. Well, I wish happy birthday to his uh, housing association and also commend the uh, housing associations and the local authorities up and down the country who have got the ambition to get the homes built. We will do our bit as central government, whether it's on planning reform, whether it's on the infrastructure funding, but we need the local authorities to be up for this challenge and so I commend him on the work he's doing and on his housing associations. Um, since 2010, uh, Dame Rosie, we've delivered over 357,000 new affordable homes, including over 128,000 homes at social rent. And the Honourable Gentleman will know that uh, between 1997 and 2010, the number of social homes for rent fell by 420,000, and waiting lists rocketed by 70%. But as I said to him, um, we, I, I, I will give way to the Honourable Lady. Address the issue of affordable and its meaning. Uh, what would he say to my constituent Tracy, who, rather than move into a brand new L and Q property uh, where she needed it, said, "Siobhan, I can't move in there because you see, me and my partner, we work and we can't afford the thousand pound a month rent." Well, I'd say to her and her constituents across the board that we're absolutely restless to create more affordable homes so they can realise their dream of home ownership. And the one way I would encourage her and her parties not to be voting against cutting stamp duty for first-time buyers, I don't think doubling council tax would be the answer, but what I would say to her is I share her aspiration for precisely those people to give them and realise the dream of home ownership and we will be straining every sinew to make sure that that happens. And that's why we've announced a package of measures to help local authorities build additional affordable homes for their local communities. The autumn budget provided a further boost with the announcement that local authority housing, new, housing revenue account borrowing caps will be increased by £1 billion. This has been mentioned by uh, both uh, the Honourable Gentleman, and I think this is good news. The, 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 this is something where we're making progress. Local authorities will be able to bid for increases in their caps from 2019-2020 up to that total of £1 billion by the end of 2021-2022. And again, it will be for local authorities in areas of high affordability uh, pressure where authorities are ready to start building. Um, but that decision should be welcome news, and I, I hope the Honourable Gentleman will take that back to his local authority. Um, it shows that we've listened to local authorities and honourable members across the House who have asked for that increase. Um, it will come on top of the £3.5 billion 
worth of borrowing headroom that is already available to local authorities across England. And we will be releasing information shortly about how councils can apply for an increase in their local housing revenue account cap. So I'm keen to see local authorities um, from wherever they are across the country, and obviously, uh, irrespective of where uh, they are across the political divides, I want to see those local councils take up that opportunity to bid. I hope the local MPs will get on board and back them, and we can have a broader cross-party approach to this. I want to see that programme subscribed, and well subscribed at that. So I would encourage all local authorities to think about how the additional borrowing can help them to deliver more council homes for their local community. And, and um, I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. It's, it's just on that point. Uh, why, why doesn't the Government and the Minister consider removing the cap altogether? Well, I'd say to the Honourable Gentleman that we raised it by £1 billion. Um, if uh, we um, uh, are going to go further, we need to take a more balanced approach and um, make sure that we're fiscally responsible, as well as giving the leverage and the flexibility to local authorities. But we do keep the position under review. So I would uh, recommend that the um, uh, honourable gentleman uh, support his local authority um, uh, in, in any bids they put forward. And I would say that to all honourable uh, gentlemen uh, across the House. Um, on top of that, we've recently announced an extra £2 billion to deliver new affordable housing for social rent, taking our total investment in the Affordable Homes Programme uh, to £9 billion over the period 2016 to 2021. The Chief Executive of the National Housing Federation, David Orr, has described this extra funding as a watershed moment for the nation. And local authorities, as well as the housing associations that my honourable friend has referred to, will be able to bid for this money, which will go where it is needed most and in particular to those areas where uh, there is acute affordable, uh, pressure, affordability pressure, Dame Rosie. Again, we'll be releasing information shortly about this programme, and I would encourage all those local authorities, all the housing associations to bid, um, and uh, make sure, as far as possible, I would urge local, uh, local MPs to get behind them. In addition, we're giving local authorities more certainty over their rental income. Uh, from the period from now up to 2025. We're setting a longer-term rent deal for local authorities, enabling them to increase their rents by up to CP CPI plus 1% for five years from 2020. That will provide local authorities with extra oomph and greater confidence in their approach. It will enable increased future rental income to underpin future house-building plans, and it will give, we hope, and we're confident, uh, local authorities greater uh, reassurance and greater confidence so that they can build more homes more quickly and do so in a way that benefits local communities. All of this, rent certainty, the additional HRA borrowing, borrowing the billions for new affordable housing, affirms our commitment to make sure we see uh, extra council house, housing uh, built on scale and our commitment, of course, to giving the councils the tools, the flexibility, the leverage to do the job. And uh, I'll give way to my honourable friend. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that. Quite rightly, he's highlighting, as have all speakers, the importance of council housing, but also the strong support this government is giving to councils in that respect. But as my honourable friend, the member for Walsall North, made clear, there are a range of models and types of housing which are important in the provision of social and affordable housing. Would the Minister agree? with me that the forthcoming Social Housing Green Paper is a good opportunity to look at that mix and the way in which we deliver social housing in this country in the round. Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I would say to my honourable friend, he's absolutely right. We're not dogmatic about the vehicle or the form. And, of course, the nature of the demand will be different from area to area, depending on the demographics and the geographic locality. Um, and we need to have the flexibility to provide the right housing at scale for the individual needs of the local community. And in the same breath, it's important to point out that under the reinvigoration of the right to buy in 2012, local authorities were allowed for the first time to keep the receipts from the additional sales to fund new affordable housing. It was a, a point that I think both honourable gentlemen made. And overall, councils, of course, have risen to the challenge. They have uh, used their receipts to deliver new homes. And in fact, if you take um, Warwick District 
Council as an example, it has demonstrated it is committed to building replacement homes and is working hard to ensure that their delivery is on time. And in fact, I um, prized out the local data for Warwick District Council because I knew the Honourable Gentleman would wish to applaud it. And they've actually, um, in relation to the 110 additional sales, 33 of which needed to be replaced by now according to the three-year deadline. In fact, they have started or acquired 87 replacements, so it's more than meeting the one-for-one -one commitment locally. And I know the Honourable Gentleman will want to applaud Warwick District Council for uh, taking a lead in that regard. Of course, I give way. Um, I just wanted to clear up a point that was made by the Honourable Member for Warrington and Leamington. He described that houses that had been purchased through the right to buy had fallen into the hands of others. Well, as that policy was introduced in 1980, 38 years ago, it is perhaps not surprising that the right to buy also goes hand in hand with the right to sell. And after 38 years, it might be appropriate that you'd sold on your property. We're just about to hopefully enjoy a trial of voluntary right to buy in the West Midlands. I'm hoping perhaps the Minister could touch on that. I think uh, my honourable friend makes some important points, and I'm certainly looking forward to the pilot in the Midlands of the Housing Association voluntary right to buy, and indeed renewing and reinvigorating our commitment to right to buy in that sector. Um, and we've been engaging with both local authorities and housing associations uh, on their views, uh, and those will be fed into the Social Housing Green Paper. And of course, the measures that I've already announced will also help to make a real difference in enabling councillors uh, and councils to deliver those new homes. Supporting local authorities to increase council housing is, of course, only part of the story, though, and, and that's probably where I differ slightly from the Honourable Gentleman. We're also implementing a range of other measures to increase the supply of homes across the board, and frankly, whether it's for rent or for ownership uh, and whatever the sector, it's the overall supply of new homes that will bring down um, affordability over time if, we're, if, if we get it right. Um, and uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, to deliver this, um, housing was front and centre of the autumn budget. It made over £50 billion worth of new financial support for house building available over the next five years, bringing the total support for housing to at least £44 billion over the period. It was the biggest budget for housing in decades. More money was announced for infrastructure. We almost doubled investment in the Housing Infrastructure Fund to £5 billion, and we promised an additional £400 million to regenerate run-down areas. Um, and, um, of course, uh, Warwickshire has benefited, and he probably knows this already, both from the viability funding but also from the forward funding, millions of pounds for extra infrastructure to support local authorities build the extra homes so we don't just build more homes, we also build up our communities. I think that's very important. We've given more help to small and medium-sized builders. Uh, I, think, I think it was the Honourable Gentleman that, that, that referred to planning reform. We've revised the National Planning Policy Framework, which has gone out to consultation uh, now, which will help us focus local authorities and develop, developers on the delivery. Um, and the review by my right honourable friend, the member for Dorset West, will report by the budget um, for, uh, with proposals to address the whole issue of the build-out rate when developers get their planning permission, making sure that those homes are built, making sure that the planning application and the planning permission is not the start of some endless haggle with local authorities, which leaves communities, understandably, feeling frustrated. So, in terms of supply, we're taking action on all fronts, providing significant new funding, but also reforming the system, that's also important, and working with local authorities, and it is a team effort, and I think the Honourable Gentleman made that point himself. Uh, I've already mentioned the Green Paper on Social Housing. We, uh, and I think it's worth making this point, we should also look at the um, quality of social housing, not just the volume with which we're delivering it, uh, things like the relationship between landlord and tenant, and indeed the stigma uh, that has arisen around social housing. And I think from my experience of meeting social tenants, working hard, uh, taking pride in their community, wanting to be treated independently with some respect, I think we've got to make sure <coughs> that we get that right as well. The Green Paper will be informed by the views of those tenants uh, that we've been meeting over recent months in the Grenfell area, because of course that was the catalyst, if you like, for the Social Housing Green Paper, but also up and down the country, and I've been down uh, even in the limited time I've been in this job to Basingstoke as well as to uh, the um, North Kensington. Uh, we're grateful for the, the large number of 
tenants that have given them, uh, their, their views and fed in their experiences. These people and their communities remain our guiding light, our lodestar, if you like, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, as we take forward our proposals. And I look forward to working with the Honourable Member and indeed others across the House to make sure we deliver the safe, secure, affordable homes that the country needs and that their local communities need.